Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. I want to give a lot of time to our first guest, who I think is extraordinarily courageous. And I mean that. I don't say that very often. I don't say it either to curry favour with you or with the guests. This programme, of course, following the lead of people like David Icke and others, has been reporting on institutional child abuse in Britain and in the United States and elsewhere around the world. Uh, well, for uh, David's been doing it for 25 years. We've been covering it on the programme since the inception of this radio programme. Now, I'm delighted that our first guest has agreed to come on the programme. As I said, I think she's amazingly courageous. Um, she uh, is a child abuse survivor. And recently, the National Australian Press covered uh, her story or started to look into it finally uh, and told the story that she's been the victim of a child abuse ring which included three former Australian Prime Ministers. She was prostituted to paedophile parties at Parliament House in Canberra and she's going to be talking uh, to you and I about that uh, tonight. It's really, really, really serious stuff. She's testified to the Child Abuse Royal Commission about her experiences as well and um, well, she's got a very serious story uh, to tell us and I want to thank her very much for getting up out of bed so early there in Oz. Let's welcome to the programme Fiona Barnett. Fiona, thanks very much for coming on. How are you? Uh, pretty exhausted, to be honest. It's been a crazy week. I can only imagine it has. First of all, happy birthday, by the way. Um, you're up early on your birthday for us. I appreciate yeah. that. So happy birthday to you. Thank you. And Fiona, I meant what I said when I said you're courageous. I don't throw away words lightly. I think what you're doing takes enormous um, courage because... I know from covering stories like yours over the years in commercial radio and in the independent uh, media and in, in the independent radio world, there's a price to be paid for coming out and standing up and telling the truth about some of these heinous things. And uh, my God, you've paid the price, haven't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've been, really, I've been paying the price ever since they started abusing me, which is, you know, from my earliest memory. And um, I've been harassed ever since, and, you know, I'm 46 today. So um, this, this is just, you know, another, another episode in, you know, 40-plus years of, of hell. Do you want to tell our listeners, for, for some of our listeners who maybe haven't heard the story and have maybe picked up um, some bits on, on, on Australian media, do you want to tell us what happened to you? When, where, where does this all start, Fiona? Well, it all starts with the fact that Australia became a, a, a Nazi haven um, for, for war criminals at the end of World War II. And uh, people think, associate Nazism just with, with um, people of you know, German origin, but it's a, a lot of Slavics actually did the dirty work in um, Eastern Europe. And uh, my uh, grandmother... Helen Holozak and her partner, Peter Holozak, um, were two perpetrators. Helen worked for the Gestapo and Peter, uh, you know, I grew up with him telling me stories about how he liked to kill Jews for a living in the camps. And uh, so it started with them and they migrated over at the end of the war to, um, well, they started off in a, in a camp in Bathurst from, from memory and uh, which is, out, you know, sort of west of, west of Sydney, and um, they, a lot of these Nazi war criminals settled in an area south of Sydney uh, called the Sutherland Shire and down to, to Wollongong and even in Canberra and they went and worked on various projects, you know, like, um, you know, mines and, and this sort of thing, dams and what have you. And, uh, and they worked in, you know, doing labour work like around Wollongong south of Sydney. Um, there was a lot of work for these sorts of people and uh, when they came out to Australia they you know they didn't suddenly change their their way of thinking uh, or their their practices and um, they continued to just treat people the way they did back in Nazi Germany only um, they sort of did it more covertly once they got out here and so my my uh, grandparents well my grandmother um, she actually was Lithuanian and uh, she had a she was had a good friend, um, a fellow Lithuanian called Dr. Leonis Petraskas. Now Petraskas um, was 
a, a Nazi doctor, you know, I've, I've got copies of his papers and, um, you know, he's, and he trained in tropical medicine at Sydney University. Um, he basically was in charge of this network, this crime network uh, that I referred to. Um, and he was based at Australia's first boys' town, which was at Ingerdeen. Now, he was Jesuit trained in his background over in Europe. And um, so he, if you know, we've done quite a bit of research since, and um, he actually had huge connections with various people and um, links with, you know, the Australian military and, and CIA and all this sort of thing. And he was, he was, had very strongly linked to Dr. Anthony Kidman. And, um, you know, and Kidman sort of ran the Sydney branch, like the inner city Sydney branch of this crime network. And then you had people, um, you know, there are various branches. What people have to understand is that child sex trafficking is just another branch of this crime ring. And, you know, there's arms trafficking and drugs trafficking. And, um, you know, that's how they make their money. And... Um, Fiona, can I just jump in for a second? Can you just sit back a little bit away from the microphone? We're hearing you loud and clear, but just a tiny bit of distortion. I think you might be right on top of uh, uh, the mics there. Um, I think that might be a little bit better, uh, Fiona, thanks. You sure. talked there about Anthony, Anthony Kidman, and we, we, we covered last year uh, on, on, on this programme what happened to him. And he uh, allegedly uh, died of a heart attack in Singapore, which sounds like a pretty innocuous uh, and a pretty common thing to happen but um, it's widely believed and you've just gotten into it there that he may have been murdered because of his involvement in the uh, paedophile ring that you described there and basically to keep him quiet <clears throat> what do you think of well, that yeah um you know various people have <laughs> there's lots of things being said like oh is he still alive did he go into hiding um well i've been told from a reliable source that um, he actually was placed on suicide watch immediately after I notified uh, against him to the um, state health board. And, um, you know, I, I put in a complaint about his sexual and physical uh, abuse of me um, from, you know, a very young age to, to around about my 16th birthday. And, uh, you know, like within, I don't know, six to eight weeks, he was dead. He was gone. Fiona, you were taken um, You were taken to your sixth birthday party uh, in a rainforest. And what you've described, I mean, we've heard similar stories from survivors from different parts of the world, not just here in England, but elsewhere in the world. And what's really startling uh, are the similarities of the stories, yeah. of the details. Um, a terrible thing, I don't know how comfortable you are I suppose you'll never ever be comfortable talking about it but I don't know how you know whether you want to get into it or not to describe what happened to you and how that happened how could that happen and it, because there will be skeptics in the audience there always is I'm not a skeptic because I've seen this I've spoken to so many people what happened to you when you were six describe that and how did it happen how were you left alone like that well um I was it was my sixth birthday, and uh, and I remember, you know, I I got this red dress for my birthday and a little, you know, sort of little piano thing, and uh, my nana, uh, Helen Holzak, she came over to my house for you know my sixth birthday, and then I was driven back um, by my father to her house in Ingerdean, uh, fourteen Callister Avenue, Ingerdean, and um. From there, I was taken to an area of National Park right on the coast where you've got all these hills and, and I think there's some cliffs and whatever, and that's south of Sutherland Shire and north of Kiama. And um, I was taken there late in the afternoon and uh, basically I, I, I was taken to a, a, a kind of birthday party thing um, underneath some sort of pergola or seating um, and the, we were given cordial and there was cakes and stuff like that, and there were children. And I knew these children because they were what we call... Um, so, look, some children are bred just for the purpose of being sex trafficked. And, I mean, people say, oh, that's impossible. Is it? I mean, it's pretty easy. You just don't register their births. Um, anyhow, they 
drugged, there was drugs in the cordial and I woke up in the dark tied to the picnic table, the wooden picnic table and um, face up and then I had them, you know, freak me out and lean over me and whisper and, and what have you. And then sometime later um, I was there with the children and we were all naked and these men turned up in pickup trucks and they're thugs. There was There used to be... Um, on Old Illawarra Road, um, near near Heathcote, there was um, a dog breeder, and he's another Slavic guy, and he used to breed Doberman dogs, and uh, these dogs would would you know eat all the the body parts that you know uh, remained after some of the crimes that these people indulged in, and. Um, so these men arrived, like in these pickup trucks, and the, all the dogs came, and and uh, and they had you know guns and various things. Anyway, the children, I was told, I was pulled aside, and um, I was told, you know, basically we're going to have a we're going to have a hunt, and uh, we're going to release you know you guys to run over the hills, or you know you to run, and um, you know we're going to basically hunt the kids down. It's your responsibility, Fiona, to make sure that they live. But they didn't tell the other kids that. And um, anyway, they painted something on me and then they released me. And I and I had to convince this group of, I would have been about eight kids, eight to ten kids, I had to convince them, you know, to run. And um, I think we got over the second to third hill when, um, oh, look, they just started slaughtering the kids, basically. They caught up to us. And once I realised there was no hope of saving the kids, I ran and I ran and I ran. They didn't find me till way into the next day, the next afternoon. They were shooting the children. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, people say, oh, this is incredible. No, it's not. Look at what they did in Nazi Germany. They turned kids into lampshades, for goodness sake. I mean, how is this such a big moral leap? Uh, from what they did in Germany and the experiments they performed on people. And they used to just murder and rape people and for joy and teach their the dog, guard dogs to rape the, the Jewish women and girls for, for yeah. fun. And, yeah. You know, they just did the same stuff that they did in Germany when they came out here. People will say to me now, ask Fiona, when she was six, where were her parents? Now, I know you've kind of answered this already, but <laughs> just remind people, where were your parents while this was happening? Oh, well, my mother thought that um, she was leaving me in the care of, of my doting grandmother, Helen, Nana, because Nana would play good cop and uh, I'd be absolutely spoiled, especially in the presence of other people. And so there was this terrible, you know, dichotomy. And um, I, I, on the one hand, I was smothered in love and, perfect, uh, and, and attention and affection and this sort of thing. And then in the dark, you know, mainly Peter would uh, take over and take me to these sort of events. You know, my mum was oblivious to it, absolutely oblivious. She came from you know, Queensland and had a very normal Aussie upbringing and she never, she had no concept of this sort of stuff. My father, on the other hand, is a victim. I'm second generation victim of uh, Engadine Boys Town, Catholic based, you know, pedophile ring. And he's basically, he's crazy. You know, he's an alcoholic and, uh, and who, who wouldn't be? He, you know, at least I had one normal parent. He, he, both his parents were, were horrendous. So, you know, you know, he, he just, you know, he, he, he was clueless in the sense that he was um, just, you know, affected by his own trauma. If you're just joining the programme, it's half past the hour. Uh, Fiona Barnett is on the line to us. Uh, Fiona's story is... Well, horrific probably doesn't cover it. Uh, she's testified to the Child Abuse Royal Commission about what happened to her as a child. She was a victim of an international child sex trafficking ring. What she's just been describing there, uh, which is what happened to her when she was six, when she was um, subjected to all manner of horrors where children were haunted for sport and, um, and murdered. And she was forced to partake in it, to hide the children, um, fled for her life, and they caught up with you the following day, Fiona. What happened when they caught up, with, caught up with you the following day? Were any of these people even remotely concerned that you, young and old as you were, could put them in all manner of hot water by telling somebody what they were doing? What happened when they caught you? 
Um, <clears throat> I think they were surprised at how long I could stay away for and hide and elude them. Um, they, I mean, they've got no conscience. They don't care. I mean, the only thing they were concerned about was that they couldn't find me for so long and, <clears throat> you know, um, they, you know, I, I was... Um, not dispensable like like some of the other children and um you know i had a mother who who you know they had to answer to for some, some who'd, who'd be looking for you if you went missing because you did say earlier on and i want to clarify <laughs> this that some of these children god helped them if there is a god i don't know but somebody helped them some of these children were bred for this so they had nobody looking out for them they were specifically bred to be abused exactly what do you say to that? And, and you must get it all the time. I mean, you, to, to your credit, you, you said it a few minutes ago, is that people are incredulous sometimes and people say to you, it couldn't have happened, it couldn't have happened, Fiona, it couldn't have happened. Okay, if something is physically, humanly possible, then it's possible. And I'm not asking people to just, you know, believe me at face value, but I'm asking people, don't dismiss victims' eyes. Look into it, yeah. Yeah, investigate. Investigate. People can, you know, you've got the internet now. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. Go and do your, do, go do your homework, <clears throat> you know. And that's uh, so what I say to the journalists. I mean, yeah, don't believe what, you know, they say, where should we believe you? Um, don't. I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you to go and do a bit of investigative journalism. I believe you, Fiona, and i tell you why I believe you. There are two reasons. One being that the things you described happening to you have been described by people who've gone through this all over the world, independently of you and anybody else. They're not reading stuff and saying, all right, I'm going to make this up now, that this happened to me. There are too many similarities. And back in the early 1990s, some of, many men and women were coming secretly and privately uh, to David Icke and others to say, look, this sort of thing happened to us. This is not, um, horrifyingly, this isn't new. And that's why I, the first reason I believe it. And number two, nobody risks their well-being and uh, risks ridicule and a complete, um, you know, being mocked and laughed at by coming out and saying these things. People don't do that. Nobody comes out and invents stories like these. They just don't. I want to talk in a second about former Australian prime ministers. Now, you're pretty clever, to be fair to you. You said to me this morning, you said, Richie, obviously I won't mention anybody who's alive and um, I thank you for doing that we can't talk about anybody who's alive who hasn't yet been charged with anything for two reasons one for libel but two because um, um, you know it, it, it would help the bastards ultimately if we mention them on air now uh, because you know it would prejudice any case against them in the future so we can't do that so we'll get to that in, uh, in, 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 in a couple of minutes uh, Fiona Barnett is on the line. You can tweet at Richie Allen Show, email Richie at richieallen.co.uk. We want to hear from you now. Where do, so after this kind of initiation, this horrible experience you have when you were six, what happened then, before we talk about the, the, the politicians and the VIP paedophile ring, Fiona, what happened then after that for you? What happened in the, in the next few years? Oh, well, it's it's more, it's, you know, the stuff that happened before that sixth birthday. I mean, um, like I said, there's there's lots of branches to all of this and um, another branch, um, you know, and, and this, it's a network. It's not a pedophile ring. It's a network. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there was the involvement of um, certain Australian military and, you um, and um, the CIA are heavily involved in child trafficking as well. I mean, you can see on the, you know, just recently there was reports of CIA trafficking arms. Um, and, you know, during the war, the US military trafficked drugs uh, during the Vietnam War. And um, so there's lots of evidence of their involvement if you, if, you, if you look into it. So there's that particular branch, and of course there's the involvement of um, John W. Giddinger, who was a uh, U.S. military CIA um, psychologist. So I was actually handed over to him. He was actually um, he actually trained um, Dr. Anthony Kidman, 
and um, I was handed over to them, and I was terribly abused by them as well. And uh, and that that abuse took place at Holsworthy Army Base, which is right next door to Ingadine, where my grandparents lived. And um, I was, and and it also involved um, there was abuse that took place at Lucas Heights Nuclear Reactor, which is. Um, you know, an underground facility. It goes, I don't know, it goes maybe six, seven storeys underground. And, um, you know, they, you know, you've got to think about the isotopes that were manufactured at at, uh, at that facility and, and the use of those in, you know, PET scans and, and um, you know, cognitive uh, image sort of analysis and, and cognitive functioning and all this sort of stuff. So I was basically used as a guinea pig um, by Gittinger and Kidman, uh, with the full knowledge and blessing of the Australian government at the time. And I'm not the only victim, you know, of that. So that's one branch. Um, the actual child sex trafficking, well, that was coordinated by Kim Beasley Sr. Now, you know, you can find footage of, of Beasley admitting that he worked for, um, you know, I think it's the CIA or something like that. So he coordinated the trafficking at the time. He was um, the federal education minister under Gough Whitlam in, in his party. And, um, yeah, uh, so, you know, I was, that's through, through him he coordinated the trafficking to um, Canberra and I was trafficked overseas as well to California. And uh, all that happened around the same time. I mean, I was... So getting a, getting a, um got to me um, just before I started school. So I turned five and I turned five, you know, October 28th. And then uh, I know that I, he, he, you know, I first met him before I started school. And so after, you know, the thing, you know, the trafficking started after um, I met him, the, the, you know, VIP uh, politician stuff. So you've got to understand that there's lots and lots of, of arms to this network. I mean, you know, I saw bikies involved, you know. Bikies would do the dirty work for all these groups. Um, so, you know, and they just, it's, it's, look, it's like the mafia. It's Australia's mafia. The difference is they're all Caucasian. You know, I'm thinking, yeah. li- listening to you, that it would have been much easier back then to do what they were doing because there was no Facebook and Twitter and internet and smartphones. You know, looking back, Fiona, listening to you now, to those times, they're like the dark ages, aren't they? I mean, I'm not, we're, we're of similar age, you and I, I was... I was born in 74, so I was only born, uh, you know, just, just a couple of years after you. And I'm thinking, we lived in the, we grew up in the dark ages compared to now. It was so easy for them to do it. You know, no CCTV cameras, no special surveillance equipment, no smartphones. They were just able to do it. It was that easy for them. Yeah, it's very easy. And, and by the same token, that's what makes it easy for victims to come out now because of social media. You know, you've got these people like um, the late Kerry Packer was involved and, in, you know, I've heard um, a, a very reliable story about how um, a tw- he was trying to rape a 12 to 13-year-old boy and the boy ran away and Packer shot him. And um, his, this, to this day, this, this fellow bears the wound. You know, so when you've got um, people of that ilk um, involved, they control the Australian media. And um, so... You know, the media has done a very good job of keeping this out of the media. And, I mean, you know, Kerry Packer was known as Goanna and he was just, you know, the biggest heroin importer in Australia. And um, so, you know, this is... Social media is allowing is allowing victims to, to finally speak out. And it is, and you're right to mention the way the media is treating it. And you'll be aware of the fact that we're having our own issues with the media here, with the refusal of the British media to really take it seriously. And they pick upon any tiny perceived inconsistency in any story and then they start screaming that it's all a witch hunt. It's all a witch hunt when you and I know it isn't. Talk about the top job in the country, former prime ministers being involved. How did you come to know this um, that, 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 you know, the, the ultimate politicians, really, the leaders, the head honchos, were involved in raping and, and killing children. How? Well, you've got, well, listeners have to understand that um, this crime ring, this network, it, it is a hierarchy. 
And uh, like I said, down the bottom you had your bikey gangs and right up the top you've got your elite, um, your VIPs, and that included uh, people in the top jobs and, and members of the judiciary and, and, you know, so forth, influential people in society. And um, so basically um, there were, you know, you had different ty- also you had different types of child prostitutes and um, the really pretty ones and, you know, I'm nothing to look at now. But um, I was extremely attractive as a child and uh, I was a blue-eyed blonde and um, that made me, uh, that placed me in a different category of child prostitutes. So I was reserved, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, allowed to be touched by all the Catholic priests and all that sort of thing. I was reserved just for the VIPs. So um, I was trafficked to um, Parliament House, Canberra. Now, it was after getting a had you know started doing his uh, whatever he did with me and um and i know it was when zucchinis were in bloom because i was actually assaulted in canberra by a f- by a former prime minister who wasn't yet prime minister um after the age of five and i could have you know been up to six or something like that but it was when zucchinis come into bloom i can remember because i was i was raped in a zucchini patch up the just a, up the backyard uh, of just suburban canberra at a at a barbecue that was held in someone's backyard. So that was where I was assaulted by this one prime minister, ex, ex-prime ex minister. Um, another prime minister I was assaulted by at a um, pedophile orgy that I um, attended at Parliament House around the same time. And I was also assaulted by the Governor-General Kerr and I know Lionel Murphy, the um, Chief Justice, was, was in attendance. And uh, the rest is just a sea of faces. I mean, I can look at you know, pictures of, of some people back then. And, um, and I, you know, I recognise about a third of them. So the person who assaulted me, he's dead, um, at Parliament House was Whitlam. And um, so, and, and I know, I, look, I've since heard from other people, there's a very reliable source that, um, I, you know, I believe is um, Whitlam liked to um, be supplied with Asian boys when he was, you know, in Sydney, and uh, and uh, so one of those victims is is sort of talking out. But um, people say, you know, I've had you know sixty minutes of you know um, narrowed down. Uh, they've, they've developed a short list, sixty minutes Australia, of, of thirty people who've been uh, who are victims of this same VIP room, and I was one of the people that they were getting information off and interviewing my, my friends and all this sort of stuff, and. Um, you know, they, you know, somebody came back to me and said, oh, you know, Kerr's a known homosexual. We don't believe that he would molest you. And it's, and I'm thinking, well, you know, like bestiality, homosexuality, uh, uh, you know, pedophilia, or, you know, heterosexuality, all these acts, and uh, uh, they're not mutually exclusive in this world. These people just did it for whatever reason, you know. They... They're, when they indulged in sex, it was perverted and like they, they, they were insatiable. And um, well, Can I just ask you something on that? Before I read out some tweets, because I've had quite a few tweets and a couple of emails on this. When um, people who've looked into this for years, like David Icke, um, suggest that one of the things that they're after is the prepubescent energy of young boys and girls, uh, is that something you subscribe to Fiona? Is that something you think is, is a possibility? Well, I the three former PMs that I refer to, I didn't see them involved in anything else other than just what I'm describing. So I can't testify to, you know, what they believed, okay? So all I saw them was in this capacity as a child prostitute at sex parties, these three people. Well, actually, I, I just correct myself there. Sorry, um, I was I was assaulted by two former PMs. The third, uh, he certainly didn't like girls, as far as I know. I, um, I well, I might have seen him around Canberra. Um, the main encounter I had with the third ex PM, he and this is well documented. He liked to travel to Thailand and have sex with boys there, and um, I turned up with Dr. Leonis Petruscus. I think I was about eight or something. I have to check all my police statements. But um, I, 
you know, and people have to understand that I've got to work out when all these things happened. You know, I have to go, okay, I had that dress then. I go to my mum and say, well, what was that? What happened around that time? And, you know, this sort of, so I have to work out a lot of these ages. Sometimes I'm very clear about the age for some reason. And other times I've got to go back and work out what was happening in my life yeah, at that time. Yeah, yeah, That's understandable, um, yeah. So um, anyway, this particular ex PM, um, I turned up with Leonis Petraskis um, to a very remote, remote beach back then, more remote than it is today, at Cornell. Now, this is in the Sutherland Shire, um, south of Sydney. And um, I was told to go and dig there. That's what Leonis Petraskis did. Anyway, I dug and there was a body of a five-year-old blondish boy and uh, in the sand, you know, and the look on his face was awful. And I sort of overheard discussion and I put two and two together about it all. And this ex-PM, he was into necrophilia. So this child was had been murdered in some way and um, I know that there was talk of... I, see, Leonis Petraskis used to sign all the death certificates, um, a lot of them, in, in, in for, for these criminals to cover for any uh, murders, you know. Well, as you, said, as you said yourself earlier on, in many cases there wasn't any need for death certificates because the children didn't exist anyway. Yes, but if they abducted a child... If they took a child, yeah, yeah, yeah. And saw quite a number of abductions and that sort of thing. So obviously this is a child who had a registered birth and you know, something had happened. And um, anyhow, I know that he did this death certificate and he attributed it to a blue ring doctor you know, sting. Anyhow, this... Uh, Leonis Petraskis, um, researchers have subsequently found, you know, I've made all these claims about him and it's external researchers that found all this information in the last six months. Anyway, they found that he actually wrote a paper when he was working, I think, in Papua New Guinea and being an expert on tropical medicine, having graduated from Sydney University in this extra extra qualification, he wrote an article on the death of a five-year-old from a conefish sting. So he was an expert in blue ring octopus stings. Right. So just interesting you know there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that's come out since can i read a few tweets and we've got about six maybe seven minutes left i want to read a few tweets and then i want to ask you a couple of final questions if you're just joining the program fiona barnett is a child abuse survivor and a whistleblower and um she's telling a horrific uh, a, a horrific story but it isn't a story it's a fact of um you know, uh, the pandering of children to VIP paedophiles, child murder, ritualistic sex games that have gone on. A story we've heard from all corners of the world from different survivors in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, the advent of social media, of course, means now, as Fiona herself said earlier, is that we're hearing more about it now uh, than we ever did. Angela on Twitter says, I know she's telling the truth. My gut hurts just listening. I wonder if some of our childhood nightmares are soul memories. Uh, and I've got a question from Shane's angle. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Gary was on to say, the sad fact here is these people have been untouchable due to a control system ruled by sickening evil. Scott was on to say, I'm shocked at what I'm hearing. How can a human being do this to another? Uh, Colin was on to say in Dublin, uh, I'm back uh, listening to the show, Richie. Uh, I've had a tough time of it lately, but uh, nothing compared to uh, Fiona's story. I feel myself lucky listening to Fiona now. Uh, there are lots of tweets like that. Uh, expressing sympathy and admiration at the same time for your courage, Fiona. But Shane's angle on Twitter asks, and we've got about five minutes, ask Fiona about her burial at Waterfall Cemetery at eight years of age. Mm. Well, there was, yeah, um, one branch of this crime network um, were involved in um, a terrible, you know, religion and um, as part of their religious practices, uh, they put me um, in a... There's a, a very old uh, graveyard that's very creepy. It's called Garawara Cemetery, and it's near Waterfall Consumptive Hospital, and um, you can just look it up. And I've you know, got a photo of that on Independent Australia in an article I wrote about it. And um, basically I was eight, and uh, Leonis Petraskis was in attendance, as were a few other people including my grandmother, and um, they lowered me into a grave, and I remember it had, like, cold, smooth walls, and uh, on top of a, um, you know, partly decayed corpse, 
Um, and uh, anyway, they told me, oh, the corpses, they called it a ghoul and they said it's going to come alive and it's going to, uh, well, just said it's going to come alive. Anyway, I mean, they laid me down into that and they closed the lid and I screamed my head off. I mean, probably one of the worst experiences I had and um, I screamed to the point where I suffocated and I um, woke up in the Sutherland um, Hospital and in a, in a room that was clad with blue tiles and, and there was really nice nursing and medical staff and, and I had an oxygen mask on and she was cooing, oh, look, we nearly lost you and all this. And then she said, Mummy's here. And I looked down to, thinking my mum was there and it was and it was, it was the wife of an Ingadine police officer who was involved in um, the Ingadine Boys Town pedo ring and, um, you know, they and, and they were freaked out because they didn't mean for it to go that far, you know. And, uh, yeah, that was a horrific experience. And the funny thing is, years later, I went back and visited the hospital and I fronted at the ER and there was this, um, you know, nurse, triage nurse with, a, a you know, an accent, some sort of German accent. And I just said, look, I suffocated when I was eight. Um, do you have a room with blue tiles? And I described the room and where the door was and everything. And she looked at me and she said, come with me. Mm -hmm. And I... Yeah. She said, "She said every part of the hospital has been renovated except for this one room." And she took me to the room; it hadn't been touched. It was like, except there was a bit of furniture missing, and you know, but it was the room, you know. And in theory, <laughs> and in documentation, I've never been to that hospital, so yeah. Do you think finally, Fiona? Because I'll I'll be inviting you back on again. You've got an open door to come on any time that you've got any information for us or any news. I don't know what. To, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I never have a clue what to say to somebody like you. There's nothing I can say uh, to you that, you know, will really mean anything other than I I, I mean it uh, when I say that I'm sorry for what happened to you. I really am. I can't imagine what it was like. I wouldn't even pretend to. Do you think finally that when you testified to the commission, as I mentioned earlier on, you've testified to the Child Abuse Royal Commission, ironically. Do you think they, or anybody there listening to you, took you seriously? Oh, absolutely. Professor Milroy is an Indigenous um, lecturer from Western Australia, and uh, she was marvellous. Oh, she was crying, as was the um, uh, Attorney General lawyer in attendance. Yeah, she was fantastic and she was very encouraging. But, you know, they're bound by um, the government and what the government allows them to do. But, look, I just want to say, look, don't feel so sorry for me as for another group. You know, I'm just the voice of uh, a lot of people who are unable to talk for themselves. You know, they're, they're too fragile, uh, they're, they're too disabled or they're, they're dead, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, you think about the kids who, who are in wheelchairs and... And, um, you know, can't even speak, cerebral palsy, or, you know, Down syndrome, this sort of thing. Um, I, that's what I think about. And um, I believe my job is to give those victims a voice. And I'm not the only one. I've had so many people and other organisations that I've associated with. They're all, people are coming forward now. You know, we've got um, somebody else is, is um, looking to um, go public about being, a, being abused by one of the same um, former PMs that, um, you know, I, I allege abused me. And, um, you know, she's she's very credible because um, her family were friends with this former PM. And can you say family photos, you know, snapshots? Yeah, with the yeah, yeah. So there's people out there, you know, I'm not the only one. Fiona, you're absolutely brilliant. I want to direct people to independentaustralia.net. Uh, go on there. Uh, as a as a kind of a first step to finding out more about Fiona. A lot of articles there written by Fiona, independentaustralia.net. I'll tweet that out there. Uh, we've just got to wrap it up now because we're coming up on news. But please yeah. do come back on the programme again whenever you want. Sure. Also, I've put some information up on a site called pedophilesdownunder.com. So I'm going to be gradually putting up some memoirs. And um, also, I've, you know... I've, I'm out there on Facebook under uh, Fiona Barnett and Twitter um, at Fiona Ray Barnett. Fiona, enjoy your birthday uh, today. Happy birthday again. Thanks very much. It sounds weird, doesn't it, saying that after what we just heard, but um, do enjoy it. Spend it with your friends and, 
and uh, have a good time. Thanks for the courageous work that you do. And um, I believe these people will eventually be brought to justice, those of them that are still alive. And even the ones who are dead uh, in time, it's all going to come out what these people were doing. I think you're great. Thanks for coming on. Bye for now. Much. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Fiona Barnett on the line to us there, uh, not far from Canberra in Australia.